She went a whole week asking and asking and asking, nothing happened, so finally she calls his father in. And she sits down with the father and the little boy next to her, and he says, she says, you know, your son has not been doing his assignments because I asked him, who's the signer of the Declaration of Independence? And the father turned around with the son and said, just admit you signed the stupid thing so we can get out of here, son. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about freedom. And the concept of freedom that we have, we're going to go into Galatians 5, and the concept of freedom that we have is that it's voluntary freedom. We have the choice of going the other way, but I want to talk about that voluntary freedom a little bit, and what Paul's saying to the church in Galatia. So let's just go to the Lord as we begin in prayer here. Father God, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for the, the weather that we've been having, the, the moisture that we have, Lord, it's just a beautiful thing. And, and I also thank you, Lord, for all that are gathered here today, Lord, to come and worship you and to spend time in fellowship. And Father, as we go into this, I just pray that you give me the words that you want spoken and soften our hearts and our ears to hear directly from you, Lord, and let the Spirit move in this place. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> Galatians 5.1, I'm going to bring that one up first. Paul writes in Galatians, says, It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The concept of someone being freed from slavery and then voluntarily going back to slavery is beyond our, our comprehension. We've been born in a time and a place where slavery is not something that we see in our, in our world or our surroundings here. We live in a, the land of the free. We live in a time and a place where that's not something that we know of other than history, although slavery does still take place all around the world. But, Paul's talking about a different kind of slavery here. And he's talking to the church in Galatia because they have a, they have a problem, they have an issue. Okay? He says, do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So what his concept is, is you've been freed already don't voluntarily go back to slavery. And I think that applies to all of us. And the way, the way that Paul talks about it here applies to all of us. He says, you don't need to go back. We need to understand that the blessing of God, the freedom that we have to serve Him, came through our salvation. And our freedom is just that. Christ set us free for that purpose. He set us free for freedom's sake. He wants us free. Now the church in Galatia is having a problem. Paul had gone through Galatia, witnessed to them, and the church started up. It sprouted up and took off. But he's writing this letter back to him now because he's hearing things that he doesn't like that are coming out of Galatia. And one of the things that's going on, and I'm, he talks about circumcision and stuff here, but I'm not going to go into that that much. But there have been people who came from Jerusalem <coughs> saying, it's great that we're following Jesus, but we also have to obey all the Mosaic laws and all those kind of things again. And it's causing some strife in the church, because if someone was Jewish beforehand, they know what's going on. If they're not Jewish, now they have to do all these other things. And the concept here is that they're trying to add on to the gospel. And I think we do that too. If anybody ever tells you there's a certain list of rules you have to do if you're following Christ, they're missing the point. Run away from that person. What God really wants us to know is that faith in Christ is all that we need. That is our freedom. Now Paul talks about two different kinds of slavery. here. But in Romans 8, 2 it says, Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives us life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Paul talks about two kinds of slavery that's going on, that is going on within the Galatian church, and it's a risk of anyone, of any of our churches, or any of us as believers could fall into these traps. So, let's go to the first one. Two slaveries, legalism and sin, sin and death. Okay, Galatians 5, 4 through 6 says, you are trying to be justified by the law that alienated from Christ. You've fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. 
So I underline this uh, emphasis here, both the underlining and the bold are on me. That's I put that in there. But through the Spirit, we should be awaiting by faith the return of Christ and the righteousness that is developing within us. Through the Spirit, that's supposed to be happening. But he says, you who are justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. If our connection with Christ is good, it's connection through the Spirit. Jesus left the Spirit here as a comforter, a guide, and to be here. And he says, I am with you always. And that's what this Holy Spirit is. The Spirit is God's presence and Jesus' presence here on earth that we can experience right here, right now. We didn't get a chance to walk with Jesus on the earth, but we get a chance to be with him through the Spirit. So the Spirit has that connection with us. The minute we start stacking other things in front of it, rules, how you dress, how you look, what kind of music, all these kind of things. Once we start stacking that in there, we're starting to put a wall up between us and Jesus. Take all the different possible rules that a church can come up with and stack them up like bricks. And that wall can get pretty tall, pretty tall, pretty high. And we can look at each other as believers in Christ and say, well, you know, you're not really a Christian if you don't fill in the blank. And that's not what Jesus said. If you believe in me. That's all he said. It's all about faith. So when we look at this last part here, it says the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The minute we start putting up barriers for ourselves or for other people, we are not expressing our faith through love. We're starting to limit that. It's easy to fall into that category, though, isn't it? It's easy to fall into that legalism. It's easy to fall back on structure because we love that in our own world. The world loves structure. The people that are at the top of society love structure. They want numbers, they want surveys, they want organizations, they want committees. I loved our church in Blunt, but I got put on a... There was a lot of committees, and I was on two or three of them because we weren't a big church, but there was one committee that I, I just outright laughed when they said, you know, we're going to appoint you to a committee. It was a nominating committee for committees. I was on a committee to make other committees. We only had 30 people in church. What kind of committee did we need? We could all just talk about it. In the end, that's really what happened anyway. But it was a committee to make committees. As humans, we like to kind of have that control. That control of things, the order of things. We like to be able to, to control things so much that we control ourselves away from the Spirit. I saw a Facebook post I shared this week that says, God is not yet done writing your story. So stop trying to steal the pen. It's that control issue that we have. And that's where we bring this legalism in. Legalism is defined as the excessive adherence to law or to formula. To law or to formula. <clears throat> so what happened in Galatia that did this? Paul says, what happened? You were running a good race. Who cut, in, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? What kind of persuasion does not come from, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you? A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Again, Paul pulls an athletic one up here again. He pulls a sports analogy. You're running, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you? Who stopped you? You were going the right direction and somebody stopped you. Somebody cut in front of you and backed you off. Why did they back you off and why are you listening to them? He says that kind of persuasion doesn't come from God. If you are running with the Spirit and someone steps in front of you and tells you you're doing it wrong, that's not from God. So, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I don't make bread. <clears throat> But my wife does. I've seen her. Yeah. I've seen her <coughs> make bread. She doesn't do it as much anymore now that I can't eat it. But she used to make bread all the time. And if you look at all the ingredients that go into a batch of bread, and I don't care how big that batch is, yeast is just a little tiny bit of it. And if you know how yeast works, 
the bubbles in the bread come from the yeast. That's what makes it rise. And the gluten and the yeast interacting and it rises up. And that's how you get the bubbles in the bread and the good soft bread that you like is all full of those bubbles. That comes from the yeast. The yeast is alive. It's a bacteria. As it grows inside the bread, it spreads throughout the bread. So the concept of the fact that we have bacteria in our food that we then bake and kill off the bacteria and destroy the holes in the bread. But what Paul is saying is it doesn't take much. And Jesus said, beware the yeast of the Pharisees. It doesn't take much. And it changes everything. The difference between an unleavened loaf and a loaf with yeast is huge. And Jesus is saying, watch out for that yeast because it gets into everything. Once you let it start wiggling in, it takes over. And that's what the legalism does. It takes over. Once it comes in, it becomes tradition. How many times have someone been asked, or have you been asked, or have you asked yourself, well, why do you do it that way? And what's the normal answer? Because we always have. Why do we do that? Because that's the way we've always done it. Nobody remembers why or how it started or anything like that, but I guess that's what we do. If that's a justification for what you're doing, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. You should have more facts behind that. And I bet students ask me the same thing. If they say why and I can't answer them, I gotta go find an answer. When I was a kid, occasionally, because I said so was enough. Because by the time that comes out, you just stop. But as we get older, because I said so isn't enough. We need to know more. And the minute we start putting ourselves under that blanket of tradition and liturgy and all the things that we don't understand what they are, but, it's ne but we think it's necessary, we're taken away from God again. Because the simplicity of faith is all that's needed. We talked about that a little bit last week. And Jane got a book. She reads books for Amazon and does reviews just constantly. I don't know what you get, eight of them this week or something. And she buzzes through books really quickly. She got one from that was written by a theologian. And I don't remember what the title was. But whatever it was, it didn't portray what the book really was because this was a, a college-educated theologian that from the very beginning says, I don't believe in Christ whatsoever, I don't believe in God. But she got a theology degree, which just sounds, that sounds strange to me. Why would you do that? Well, she had an agenda, and as Jane got in the book, it was obvious what her agenda was. She started pulling up all sorts of other things, and I said, that's a dangerous book. If we send some of our kids off to school, to college, and they take a theology class, and there's a professor that wants to pull that book in and make it mandatory reading, you think, well, they're an authority, they're a teacher, a teacher says this is a good thing to read, but if you read about it, they, uh, she's all wrapped up in uh, the LBG, whatever letters, uh, agenda, she didn't think we should really, we, we should reckon, or to, uh, we shouldn't speak of Jesus as a he, and all sorts of things that were really off in there because it all walked away from the Bible it all walked away from the Word of God it all walked away from what God intended and that's why Jesus said often faith is so simple it confounds the wise if you want to force it to be complicated you lose it just take it on what it is it's simple faith is simple the faith of a child so Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall no, no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the point that Paul is trying to make. Don't go back to being under the law. Prior to Jesus, there was no salvation. You could not reach salvation through works. But what did the law say? Sacrifice. Do this. Live this way. Obey, the, obey these things. Obey that things. Those were all set out. As a, as a guidance by God for us to understand how, fall, how short we fell. Jesus completed the law. He didn't say I came to abolish the law. He said I came to complete the law, the ultimate sacrifice. So if you turn around and go back to that, are we not rejecting his sacrifice? 
And that's what Paul is saying. Pete, you were supposed to keep that fly with you. Go ahead, next one. I put peanut butter or something on it next week to hold the fly. Okay, so Jesus himself, John 8, 32, 36. For, you, then, you, for then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You will be free indeed, period. They're trying to claim, well, you know, we're, we're, we're the children of Abraham. And he said, it's not about the children, it's about the son. It's not about who you, who you claim your lineage to. It's about whether or not you accept the son. Now, earlier in, in uh, Galatians 4, Paul draws the parallels between Sarah and Hagar and says, you are children of Sarah children of the free woman you are the free side of things you have ex you have gotten to that point don't go back to the slavery don't choose the slavery he's I can just hear his frustration as we read through his words why are you going backwards who came in and said something enough to get you to turn away from where you were supposed to be going but he talks about some more other than that too Peter he talks about a second slavery as well, and that's the sin of self-indulgence. The reason for that is some in the Galatian church took the concept of freedom a little too far. And they said, well, since we're saved, since we're free, we can do anything we want because, hey, it's okay. We're covered by grace. And Paul says, that's not good for you either. Don't go this direction. Don't go this direction. Stay on path. <laughs> Galatians 5.13, you, my sisters and brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Again, don't use your freedom to fall away. And he talks about this at length, and we're going to go into some more of this a little bit, but he's talking about this simple concept, but don't make more of it than it is either. Don't make less of it by the legalism, but don't make more of it by saying, hey, we can do whatever we want. That's not the intention either, because Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my commands. And he said, love one another. We live in a free country. We have the Bill of Rights. You have the right to free speech, assembly, all these kind of things, freedom, uh, freedom of religion, all these things. But I can't walk up and punch Clinton in the face. I am not free to do that because my freedom stops when his freedom begins and he is, he is free not to get hit in the face by me. So anything that we were to do that would take away from the grace God gave us and use it against us is, is going to be offending other people. And we're going to, not only is it going to harm us, but it's going to harm those around us. And that is not love. The love that Jesus uh, expressed and the love that he wants for, uh, from us is not that kind of sin. That will take away our witness and that will take away our communication with the Spirit and that will take away our walk with God. So we can't be living that way either. Now he lists, he has a long list here. We're going to talk about this for a second. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. This is the list of things he specifically mentions, but it doesn't mean this is all there is to it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul never makes words. He laid it out hard and fast. Why would he talk to them about these things? Because these were issues. These are things that are going on in your church. So let's talk about these. I'm going to give you a list. And we can take that list and we can, we can expand on it if we wanted to. But it's easy for us to sit, for people to look at this and say, well, you know, I'm not sexually immoral. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not impure. There's no debauchery in my life. Oh, I don't have any idols. Well, of course we do. We have to be careful because it's very easy for us to make idols out of a lot of things. 
I talked to a man about coming to church. He said, your church runs from 9 to 11? I said, yeah, church and Sunday school. Said, it's football season. I don't know if I'll get home in time for the game to start. Okay, so what's your idol? Well, his idol happens to be football, and so he puts that before God. Other things. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, anger, all these things that we put in ourselves, selfish ambition, this is all self-indulgence. This is not God's love. This is self-indulgence. So we've got the legalism on one side, but the other side is all about me, me, me. It's all self-indulgence. So he then shows us the other way. This, is, this letter from Paul, is, it's a type of, of argument, a type of discussion, it's a type of rhetoric where he's, he's circular about it. He says one thing, circles around, comes back, circles back around. So these passages from, from Galatians 5 are, may not be exactly one after the other. I kind of went back and forth because that's the way the, the rhetoric works. So in Galatians 5, 16 through 18, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He just explained what the desires of the flesh were. If you walk with the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the, of the flesh. You won't fall off. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. That is, the conviction of the spirit right there is adamantly against the flesh. And that can be hard to deal with. Because it's a surrender. We are saved from slavery, and yet we still need to surrender ourselves to the spirit. We are free to follow the Spirit now. But we are not free to do whatever we want. We still have to walk with the Spirit. And that concept that the Spirit is on one side and the world is on the other should not be new to us because Jesus said very simply, either you're for me or against me. That's all there is to it. This is not my home. This is not our home. This is not where we belong. So if we conform with this, we don't belong, we don't conform with where we do belong, which is back with God in heaven. So conforming with the world is going against the spirit. Conforming with the spirit is going against the world. Again, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. If you led by the spirit, you are not under the law. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not able to do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What is the law? The law is sin. The conviction of sin. And it's an uncomfortable reality for our world because we want everything in this, in this world right now, in our society right now, and the way things are laid out right now, everybody wants to be huggy. Everything's okay. Everything's nice. You know, I don't want to believe in a God that would condemn anybody. Well, God doesn't condemn anybody. He's just a righteous judge. You condemn yourself. The judge who sentences someone is not guilty of a crime. They are simply the judge. And to be an impartial judge, he has to. He has to be fair in both his forgiveness and his conviction. So if someone is walking in the way of sin, then, quite frankly... They are under the law, and they are going to be held to that moral code. And there is no way they could ever pay it off. And that was the whole concept of Christ's coming, is the fact that we couldn't pay for it, but he can, and all you have to do is accept it. If you don't accept it, you're not getting that payment. If you're not getting that payment, you still fall under the law. You fall under the law, that means you can't reach it. If you can't reach it, you're not going to heaven. And this short period of time we have is going to be lost. So, what do we have if we are walking with the Spirit? And this is something that we have talked about before, but I just want to bring it up as contrast to all the things he had on one list. He then gives us another list. 522 through 24 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's this list of what happens when you are walking with the Spirit. 
And the interesting thing, what I love about this, and it's kind of been a, a theme in my mind for a while, it's something that we talked about in Sunday school. Um, I love that word. I love the joy. We should be joyful about walking with the Spirit. So many people want to be burdened. They want to feel like it's work or like it's hard to do. Or they'll look at me how much I am suffering for these things. Just be joyful. Rejoice in the fact that we are walk, walking with the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, what other people will see, the fruit that you bear will be. If you look at any kind of fruit tree, you know it's healthy if you get fruit on it. I'm not going to go into the whole tomato, vegetable, fruit thing a little bit, but I just want to illustrate this a little bit. We had the best tomato crop of our lives this year, partially because we never had to water the garden. That was cool. Um, but also because we got some fertilizer from, from Carl who we put on there that I put on weekly and it just exploded. And this week they all ripened at once. So we had tomatoes all over the place and now we got tomatoes all over the place. We've been waiting for them to get ripe and apparently they decided they all talked to each other and said today, boom. So Jane's been doing her salsa. By the way, I miss KG when he's not here, but he sent us a, a card saying thank you for making me laugh. He sent us a card from last week saying thank you for making me laugh. But when you see that, you see the fruit of that plant. And without seeing the fruit, what is it? It's nothing. So God wants us to be producing this fruit also so that everyone, the fruit of the Spirit is something everyone should see on you. They should see love. They should see joy. They should see peace. They should see forbearance, patience. They should see kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So Paul's laying this out very simply. Don't pay attention to the legalist guys and do not put up with the ones that are saying that you can do whatever you want because self-control and love walk hand in hand in our fruits of the Spirit. There was a, an analogy, allegory, put out by C.S. Lewis. He's, he's the one that I have heard it from, so I'm going to go with that. He said in heaven, or in hell, everybody's sitting around a table. They have three foot long forks and spoons. The food is laying before them and they are terribly frustrated because they can't use a three foot long fork or spoon. And he said, in heaven, there are three foot long forks and spoons. And everybody is rejoicing because they're taking their three foot long fork and spoon and feeding the person across from them and now they can reach. That's the difference between walking with the Spirit and not walking with the Spirit. If we're walking with the Spirit, our joy will come through that service. Our joy will come through that time when we are together. Yeah. So, in 525 it said, Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. And I brought this picture up because being in the military, I can tell you that's something you have to learn. To walk like that. You will see everybody's right foot is going forward. You walk to a cadence, but you have to learn it. That's not something that is natural to the human, to the human being. It is sometimes. If you watch a couple that has been married for a long time, and they walk, they will walk at the same speed, and they will eventually, because they're so close to each other, have to walk in the same step. Because if you want to be close to somebody and you're using opposite legs, you're kind of turning away from them on every step, so you kind of fall into step. I saw this uh, at football practice a couple days ago. We had two guys that are real hard chargers on the team. They're pushing each other as they run around the track, and they're in perfect step with each other. It's stride by stride, just perfect. They're both wanting to push each other hard. When I was in the military, we had, when I was in basic training, we had a guy, God bless him, a young man named McVay, Indiana National Guard. The goal of his life was to be in the Indiana National Guard. That's what he wanted to do. Eight weeks, the guy could never remember left and right. The whole unit would be marching, and we always put him on the outside because he tripped people if he was in the middle. And they'd say, column left, and he would go right, and he would just keep going. If you're standing with all these people, and you're walking, and then suddenly you're not beside anybody. And he was all alone out there. 
but he never stopped because he was so afraid that if he stopped, it'd be obvious. Well, it's obvious you're walking away. <laughs> Frustrated, the drill sergeants drove him absolutely crazy. And they'd get up and they'd scream in his face and they'd put him back in there and it wouldn't take long. He'd go the wrong way again. Eventually, they told him, maybe you should just go home. And they sent him home. But it's the same with us. It's easy to see if somebody gets out of step. Because eventually they'll walk away. And Paul's saying, you need to be step by step with the Spirit. And later on in my military career, I went to, to jump school, parachute school. And there, we had to stay in step when we were running. That's a step above just the marching. And when we were running, every single day, we ran three miles, a seven minute mile in our boots. Not in tennis shoes, in boots. And when you did, you had the same cadence. There'd be one guy starting it, and it was an echo thing. You go back and forth. And at that pace, it's hard. It's hard for a lot of people. But if you fell out of step, or you weren't singing cadence, the other drill sergeants were running around, and they would grab you out of that group. They grabbed you out of there twice. Anytime during the three-week training, you're out. That's it. You're kicked out. If they grab you out once on a Friday because that was a commander's run, you're out. So if at any point in time your feet aren't hitting the ground at the same time the guy in front of you is hitting them, the guy on the left, the guy on the right, the guy behind, if you're not in step, you're done. And that's what Paul is saying here. If you're not in step, you're walking away. And when he says, keep in step, the Greek that he used there as well as in the standing firm as well as in that you were running the race is continual it's an infinitive in other words keep in step with the spirit again and again and again not once not standing still if we stand still the world will catch up all the things that would that were slain that sin was slain by jesus all those things are behind us Unless we stand still. Then they'll come crowding back in again. So what he's saying here is stay in lockstep. Foot by foot. Day by day. Minute by minute. Moment by moment. Keep in lock with the Spirit and nothing else matters. Because then the fruits of the Spirit will come through. And that's simple. Again, it's the simplicity. One of the things, I got complimented when I was in, in uh, jump school. And it was one of those things that you know, are you proud of it or not? We were running. It was the first week. And I felt breathless coming up. And we were doing our cadence. And twice I threw up on that run. But I didn't do it when I'm supposed to be singing. I did it when they were singing. I timed it. So I'd throw up at the right time. When we got done, the drill sergeant said, that's the way you do it. Throwing up through my nose, but... He said, you timed it just right. It's a strange memory. <laughs> Army grits and hot sauce coming back up. Lots of fun. All right, so. We are meant to be running that race. We are meant to be in lockstep with the Spirit. And there is a goal. That's why I said you were running the race. Because there's a goal. There's an end line. There's an end zone. There's a line to cross in the end. Revelations 2, 24, 25, speaking to uh, the church of Thyatira, the revelation says, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. Amen. Don't stop the race. Stay in lockstep with the Spirit. All the other things just get in the way. Push them aside. <clears throat> you go straight ahead to what you're supposed to be doing. Go for the goal. Everything else just going to get in your way. Don't let it grab a hold of you. Don't let it step in front of you. Don't let anybody push you offline. If you're step by step with the Spirit, I guarantee nobody's going to push you online. Nobody's going to trip you. Nobody's going to step in front of you. If you are step by step with the Spirit, because as we know through this book, we know the end of the story. Jesus is coming back and he will be reunited with the Spirit at the end too. That's all coming together and the Spirit knows that. He knows the end of the story. They shared it with us. Why don't we just stay running the way we should? That's the goal for us. 
And that's our true freedom. That's the true freedom that, that Paul is talking about here. It's not only that we are saved, but that we stay in connection with the one who saved us. We stay in connection with God. We stay in connection with Jesus, and we do that through the Spirit. And the concept there is, it never ends. I don't personally want to go back to slavery. I don't personally want to have that feeling that God is separated from me, that I'm abandoned, that I'm lost. And God says the only way you get that is if you walk away from me. If you wander off and get lost, like a little kid in the big store, <coughs> one of the most frightful things that ever happened to me in my life was at a J.C. Penney's in Winona, Minnesota. I was six years old. Not that young, I should have known better. Wandered away from mom. Couldn't find her. What I did is I found myself in the middle of the women's lingerie section. <laughs> panicked. Scared to death, knowing I shouldn't be here, but I don't know where anybody is. <laughs> but it wasn't because my mother abandoned me, it's because I walked away. And God says the same thing. Don't walk away from me. I am always with you. So if today you're feeling like you're alone, or you're feeling like there's a disconnection, go back. Walk with the Spirit. Stop and look down and see where His feet are and get in sync with Him. Sync up with the Spirit. That's in the technical terms the kids probably understand more than me. You sync up with something so it links together. Bring, us, bring yourself back, because that's what God intended. That's what He wants from us. He wants us to be close to Him, and He wants us to draw ourselves close to Him. 